Okay, so let's talk a bit about uh, our first second unit on gases. Quick recap. There's four units that we have to cover in the 20-level curriculum, four in the 30-level curriculum. So we've now done one-eighth of our like big picture course. Okay. Our first unit really focuses mostly on, on liquids in a way and how you can take a liquid, typically water, and dissolve it, dissolve something in that liquid. Okay. I know it solutions don't have to be liquid, but for the most part what we're talking about is going to be aqueous solutions. Okay. Our next unit now is going to focus on a different phase of matter. We're going to focus on gases. Eventually we're going to do a unit that really focuses on why solids are the way they are, and that unit's on chemical bonding. We do that one right before Christmas, or right after Christmas, wherever we kind of get to. So anyways, long story short, our goal right now, let's talk about another phase of matter and what we can do with this, so gases. Now, in terms of this section here, um, it's a lot more mathematically based than the last one was. So the last section was a lot of theory and puzzle and problem solving, where you had to have really good... Um, well, I guess that's the word. You have to have really, have really good puzzle skills to be able to interpret, okay, you've given me this information. How can I use it to solve the problem? This next section here, very formula-based. For those of you who did physics with me, this is going to be a lot more like kinematics, okay? where I'm going to give you some formulas, and as long as you've got good math skills, it's more or less just plug them in the formula, you're good to go. So. There is some theory still, obviously, but it's, it's more math-based. In the previous section, like it's more formula math based, I guess I should say. Okay, so let me start with my first slide here, and I'm not even going to read off of it. Let's talk about gas that we notice around us. Okay, we live you know, on a planet that has. You guys know this word. We have an atmosphere. You guys have heard this phrase before. What's an atmosphere? Don't get all shy because the principal just walked into the room behind you. <laughs> okay, guys, what's an atmosphere? What does it mean when I say that Earth has an atmosphere? Yeah, there's there's a, a layer of gas surrounding the Earth, right? Now, Earth is kind of unique because it happens to be just the right size and the right temperature. It has the right composition that everything works out well, that our atmosphere allows us to support life. Right? Because if we had a planet that was maybe uh, too large, perhaps the, the, the gases that would be trapped, they would be too dense. So, or perhaps if we had a planet that was too small, we wouldn't have enough of an atmosphere. And if we were to try to breathe, like for example on the moon, why can't we, why can't we breathe on the moon? Well, there's no atmosphere there. The moon doesn't have enough gravity to keep all of the gas close enough to the planet that there's enough of it there for us to be able to breathe. Does that make sense? Really, the key is actually gravity. Okay? There are gas particles all around us. There's one right there and there and there and there and there, right? Why are they not just floating away and leaving us and just flying off into outer space? Gravity, right? Just like this solid matter is affected by gravity, in a way, so are gases. Okay? Now, now gases do change where they're located based on density. Like, denser things go lower than less dense things. But, oh, maybe I'll pause for a second. You guys want food? Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> no muffins? Okay. Next week? Next week, guys, muffins. <laughs> okay. Where was I? So our Earth has an atmosphere, right? Due to gravity. Gravity affects all matter, right? Whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And so because of gravity, we have enough gas on the surface of our Earth for human life to survive. Now, do you guys know what most of our atmosphere is made out of? No, yeah, nitrogen gas, okay? Which, as humans, we don't really need to utilize all that much, right? It's about 77%, give or take, nitrogen gas. The next largest component is oxygen. Oxygen gas. <laughs> and as humans, we need oxygen gas because we breathe it, right? We intake oxygen, and what do we expel? Which would be a huge problem because then slowly but surely, if we intook all of the oxygen off the surface of the earth and turned it into carbon dioxide, we'd eventually run out of oxygen and we'd die. However, here's one of the most amazing things about our planet. 
is that humans intake oxygen, output carbon dioxide, plants intake carbon dioxide and output oxygen through what process? Yeah, photosynthesis. You guys know this? So, yeah, basically we, we undergo cellular aspiration where we utilize our, um, our, our oxygen, use it to create glucose, make carbon, make carbon dioxide, and then the plants do the opposite process. And because of that, as humans, we have the word I've got on here again, I want to focus on, we have an atmosphere. Okay. Now, this atmosphere is something that we don't see around us. Sometimes I think we forget about it sometimes, where we go, there, there are particles all around us. There's one there and there and there and there. There's a nitrogen, there's an oxygen. Okay. The real key here is that gases are not very dense. Darian, gases are not very dense. Okay. Solids are very thick, they're very dense. I cannot walk through a salt. Liquids, however, are slightly less dense. I can kind of swim through them if I need to. Okay. But gases, gases are not dense at all. If I were to, this is where the board's going to fail on me here. Come on. And I quit. Let's just go to this one. If I were to kind of try to draw you a, a model of what solids versus liquids versus gases look like, it might look something like this. Here's an area of space. If we're talking about a solid, a solid would have a whole bunch of particles densely compacted together. And I really should have drawn the space a lot smaller. Let's pretend it's that size box. Okay, that's a solid, right? Very dense. I cannot put my hand through a solid. I might be able to break the solid in half if I use enough force. Okay. Whereas here's a liquid. A liquid would have maybe this many particles there. Can I put my hand through that and maneuver through it? Yeah, we can swim, right? But a gas might look like this. A gas liquid is a particle here, and one there, and one there, and one there, and that's, that's like it. Okay. The rest of the space in between, there is literally nothing there. We have a name for that. Do you guys know what the name for it is? Like where you have area, you have 3D space, but there's no matter there? A vacuum, yeah. Yeah, and we can sometimes consider outer space to be like a vacuum or close to it, where in outer space, say on the moon, are there oxygen and nitrogen particles perhaps nearby? Yeah, probably, but there's probably one oxygen way over there and one more way the heck over there and one way over there. Is that enough for me to be able to breathe? No. Right? Further to that, um, there's not even the nitrogen needed to kind of fill in the space otherwise. And so that's why you have huge pressure problems. You have to wear a pressurized suit in outer space. Does that make sense? But Earth, Earth is unique because we have gravity and just the right amount that we can actually manage to maintain an atmosphere you can breathe. Now, I've got this photo on the side here I want to talk about where at, we live basically in terms of like as you go up in altitude, we live like basically there. Right? Like the amount of places where humans can habitat is pretty low. You guys know what happens like what happens when you start climbing a mountain, right? As you go further and further up in altitude, what happens to our, our, our density of gases? It decreases, right? Um, if you were to climb Mount Everest, you're probably going to bring along oxygen tanks because you actually need to bring along more air for you to breathe because the higher up you get, the, the less dense it happens to be. Does that make sense? Really, gravity is going to be stronger closer to the surface of the Earth. Okay. For those of you guys who did physics with me, I can explain this a bit. There's a formula that we learned about gravity, which said that the amount of gravity there is is based on the mass of object one. Let's make that be the Earth. The mass of object two, let's let that be gas particles. But it is inversely related to the radius between them, the distance between. I'm looking specifically at you guys, because I know you did this, right? The further the radius, the further the distance away, the less gravity affects it, right? Which now explains why way up here in outer space, the force of gravity on gases is, is less. The further away you get, the less, less there is. Side note, um, I'm a big sports fan. Denver, Colorado is notorious for being challenging for, for athletes in terms of sports. Has anybody ever heard of this before? Denver, Colorado is on um, like high altitude, right? Top of the Rocky Mountains, right? And because of this, there is less oxygen in Denver, right? Now, people who live there year round, their blood cells have kind of learned how to, how to um, 
adapt, I guess, a little bit for the fact that there's less oxygen. But if you're a professional athlete, like say the Patriots, who live in Boston year-round, and then the Patriots go and play in Denver, it's very common for athletes to like require oxygen on the sidelines, not because they're tired, but because their bodies are not used to it. And when you're doing big exercise, like playing, playing football, you, you use up more oxygen. And like since there's not enough of it in the atmosphere, your body doesn't respond very well athletically. Anybody ever heard of this before? And so there's like a hometown advantage for like the Denver Nuggets, for the Denver Broncos. Right. There's actually a story I read. I'm getting off topic, but this is cool. Well, not for him. But there's a story I read about a professional athlete. He has a blood disease. He played on the Steelers. And uh, his doctors would not clear him to play in, in Denver. You know, He wasn't physically wrong otherwise, but he had a weird blood disorder. His blood would not actually metabolize oxygen properly or something like that. And basically, the doctor said, look, if you take a really bad hit while you're in Denver – we can't guarantee you're going to live. I was like, wow, that's absolutely insane because he could play anywhere else on the, well, not on the planet, but anywhere else in terms of football stadiums. But Denver doesn't have enough oxygen for his body to like bind properly. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Well, my goal today is I want to talk about some of the properties that gases have and what we want to lead into eventually is this important one here. We gotta talk about how gases can be used to apply pressure. And we utilize this in so many technologies where we use like say a compressed gas to be able to, to do something. Okay. For example, I have one of those vacuum cleaner systems in my house. That's like a central vac. Anyone ever seen one of those before? Right? And I mean, it kind of uses gas in a way. It really, it, it uses a, a pump to pump, at least mine does, it pumps all sorts of air out of the pump on one side, but what it does is because it's kind of sealed on the other side, it basically it sucks everything through, including picking up not just the gas, but also small particles of solid. Right? Another example where we would use pressurized gas is in our venting systems here. Right? When we want to add heat to a large building, now that we use vents and like a central air conditioner or a central furnace, we can then use slightly pressurized gas. We don't have to pressurize a lot, but to then force that hot air around the building. How did we heat buildings before we had central heat and central air? Yeah, stove, like literally some sort of heating source in every room, right? If we were talking, let's say 100 years ago to be generous, right? Every single classroom would have needed to have its own wood-burning stove. Does that make sense? But now that we understand more about how to pump a hot air throughout the building, that works better. Um, I had one more that came to mind, but I've now forgotten it. All right, anyways, let me move on. Otherwise, I won't finish today. Uh, I need you guys to know some properties of gases. And so here are three pretty big ones. Gases always fill their containers, they're compressible, and they diffuse. Let's talk them through one at a time. Okay. If some of you have already printed off your assignment, the first question literally is on, like, what sort of technologies use a gas inside of them? Like, for example, a basketball. Right? That would work. Gas is always spread out. Right? If you've got a container that's, say, this big right here, are all of the like seven gas particles inside the container going to hang out over there in just that one corner? I mean, that doesn't seem logical. I mean, even if I were to use humans as an example, I have a great analogy here. You go inside an elevator. Okay. Let's say that this is an elevator, and there's one person. Where do you stand, probably? Probably in the middle. Maybe. Maybe you don't care because it's only you, right? What if there's two people? You probably stand like side by side towards the middle. You probably don't have two people just hanging out like they're right in the very, very back corner, right? Like logically, you spread out, right? Even look at you guys in the room right here. You guys naturally spread out a little bit. Not all 22 of you decided to sit at that table. You know what I'm saying here? That's just, not only is it human nature, but it's the way that matter works, right? Things want to fill their container, so these seven particles right here, they would spread out so that you'd have one here, one there, one there, one there. Right? They would, they would naturally spread out. And the cool thing about this property is that then it can be used to inflate objects, tires, beach balls, basketballs, like whatever, right? Bouncy castles. Okay? So, okay, second one. Gases can be, can be compressed. Okay? Once humans figured out how to compress gas into like a steel canister, something similar to this one right here, right? once we learn how to compress gases, we can then store a whole bunch of gas in a small space. And the reason why 
is due to this lack of there being anything right here, right? All of this area that I'm drawing in right here, what exists right there between the gas particles? Nothing. There is nothing there. And so if you wanted to, you could actually start compressing all of those particles and push them closer and closer together. And then you have a compressed gas. Now, they're very dangerous, though, if they ever become uncompressed, because what happens if you have a leak or a hole in the container? Well, it's this last thing right here. They diffuse. Diffusion is basically where you go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if you have a highly pressurized gas, like, say, a tire, and you pop a hole in it, all of a sudden all of that gas will then try to escape. Does that make sense? You guys probably know all these properties already, I'm sure. Okay, let me move on here. I've got a photo here. I'm going to skip ahead to a, a picture here of, of just kind of Earth. Okay. One of the things that I need you guys to be aware of then is that really we live kind of inside of a balloon in a way. You know how a balloon is a, an item that has gas all inside of it? Well, in a way, Earth is kind of like that where the further away we get, the, the less particles there are. There's not really like a barrier, like say a balloon or a tire or a basketball has. But in a way, we kind of live inside of, of, of a basketball or a balloon or something that's filled with air because there are particles of air bombarding us all the time. Does that make sense? I'm currently being hit by particles of nitrogen. This nitrogen molecule over here started floating and it bounced off me and it hit me there. And you know what? When enough particles of something start crashing into you and hitting you, we actually give it a name. What do we call that? Wind. Yeah. Right? Really, what is wind? Wind is when particles have enough kinetic energy that a gas, which you normally don't really notice, that gas starts bombarding you and hits you. Thank you. And you get what I'm saying here? Right? So when there's so much wind that it's able to turn over a semi on the highway, Really, it's all of those nitrogens and oxygens and carbon dioxide, all of those particles. I know there's not that many of them, but if we can give them enough energy, then maybe they can actually, like, say, knock over a semi on the highway. Does that make sense? So, Okay, back to this picture here then. Those particles that are constantly bombarding us that we might not notice, they create what's known as an atmospheric pressure. Okay? You guys ever watch the news and they talk about how, like, the pressure is increasing or decreasing? Maybe you see the weatherman... You watch the news. Who watches the news? Okay. You watch the weather map, and they show, show you the big map, and they have like an H for a high pressure system and an L for a low pressure system. You guys ever heard of that before? Or the barometric pressure? Right. What I need you guys to be aware of is that there is pressure. Gases are pressurized on us, just like there would be pressure inside of a football or a beach ball, right? And so that's what I'm trying to show you in this picture right here. Now, the interesting thing though is that pressure is dependent though on altitude. So if you are at sea level, there's a certain level of pressure. Because if you are standing right here, there are particles all around you, and those particles are hitting you once in a while and causing pressure on you. Right? Obviously, it's a little different if it's windy, but you know what I'm saying here? There's just natural pressure. But what if you're standing on top of a mountain? There's less pressure. What happens if you're standing way up on top of a mountain? There's way less pressure. Anybody ever been in an airplane or gone over like a pass and you have to do like the pop your ears sort of trick? Is what I'm talking about where you do like a, and like kind of pop your ears or however that works? That's because as we get higher up in altitude, there's less pressure because there's less particles to bombard you. Does that make sense? So, oh, okay, here's the first thing I need you guys to know. Scientists have then been studying this over the last, I don't know, two, three hundred years. And they've realized that at sea level, the pressure is about 101 kilopascals, okay. about. I'm going to give you some more technical data over time here. But we've measured that it's about this measure right here. Now, over my next slides, I'm going to talk to you guys about different ways of measuring pressure. There's about four main ones you need to know. Okay. One is known as a kilopascal, which is a very scientific unit. There's another one that's known as a millimeter of mercury which is, uh, it's, it's, it's used as an MMHG, if you ever see that. I came across this the other day. I had to get my uh, blood pressure taken at the doctor's office, and they measure the top and bottom numbers of like a 150 over 72 or whatever it is. They measure that in millimeters of mercury, your, the blood pressure. Okay. There's another unit right here. It's this one right here, MB. 
That is known as a millibar. And, and many things measure pressure in bars. Okay. There's one final one. We also measure pressure sometimes in something called atmospheres. And so my, one of my goals by the time we're done this lesson is to have shown you guys how to convert between kilopascals or millimeters of mercury or millibars or atmospheres. It kind of sucks. Pardon me. It kind of sucks that there's not just like one unit. But as pressure was discovered over time, you know, this guy in Italy decided to go with millibars and this guy over here decided to go with um, something else. You know what I'm saying? And so we actually have multiple units. All right. Let me go back to the slide I skipped here. In the metric system then, which is the one we're going to focus on probably the most, but I need you guys to know the other ones, metric system pressure is measured in a unit called Pascals. Okay. Named after Blaise Pascal. You guys may have heard of his name before. He was actually a famous mathematician too. Okay. Here's basically the concept. A Pascal is one Newton. And if you guys, you guys all should know what a Newton is, right? Because you did Newtons in Science 10, right? A Newton is a unit of force. So... The Pascal is one Newton on an area of one square meter. Okay. Draw something here. Imagine that I were to draw a square meter. I know that's not a square meter, but pretend that's a square meter. Okay. I'm now going to apply pressure on it. Okay. If I was applying one Newton on that one square meter, that's one Pascal. Does that make sense? If I were to apply two Newtons on it, that's two Pascals. Okay. Now, you can also change the amount of pressure you have by having the same amount of force, but over a smaller area. Does that make sense? So you can actually have more pressure by either pushing harder, or the area in which you're pushing will make it make it more finite. But more, more not finite, that's not the right word. Make, make, it, make it smaller, though. Does that make sense? So, Long story short is that, like I've been saying, Earth has atmospheric pressure. Okay. And... I think you guys all knew this at some point because you've experienced it through many different ways. But that's something we need to focus on. So here's the data I need you guys to write down. If I can give you a piece of advice, grab your data booklets. You're going to want to write this in there. So scientists realized that pressure was about 101 kilopascals, give or take. But they, they were a little bit more precise. This is a great explanation of precision. Okay? 101 gives you three sig digs. It's not bad. Don't get me wrong. But scientists wanted to be a little bit more exact than that. So they realized that the pressure at sea level is 101.325 kilopascals. And they also realized it's temperature dependent. As the temperature goes up and down, it also changes the pressure. Why? What does temperature do? They start moving faster. If particles start moving faster, they're going to hit you with more force. If they hit you with more force, there's going to be more pressure. So temperature does change how much pressure there happens to be. So what we've done is scientists have two standard conditions. Okay? If I ever talk about standard temperature and pressure, we're usually talking about sea level here. We're talking about 101.325 kilopascals, very precise number, and zero degrees Celsius. And scientists decided to call that the standard temperature and pressure so that we can relate things to that and say we either have greater than standard or less than standard temperature. Here's the problem. As scientists started working with this, they realized that although zero degrees Celsius makes a lot of sense due to some properties of, say, water, I can't do a lot of experiments in zero degrees Celsius. We don't work outside in the cold. And so it was really silly to pick STP, standard temperature and pressure, to be 101.325 and zero. Because no one wants to work at zero. Does that make sense? So the, the newer one that scientists usually work with is called standard ambient temperature and pressure. And they did two things here. One, they changed the temperature reading to 25, because that's roughly room temperature. Roughly. It's a little bit high, but it'll work. And they made it 100 kilopascals. I think the reason why is twofold. One, 100 is a nice round number. It's nice to work with, right? But two, okay, I know it's less precise, okay? But two, the other reason why it's useful is that it, um, as we go up in, in elevation, remember how we talked about how as you, as you increase elevation, the pressure decreases? Most people in the world don't live at sea level. Some do, for sure, right? But like, say, um, Fort McLeod, 
Fort McLeod is 965 meters above sea level, which means that our pressure is going to be less than, say, if you lived in Holland, where there's some places that are actually below sea level. Right? So, anyways, I need you guys to know these temperatures and pressures because if I ever talk about a standard temperature or pressure, these are the ones we use. So. Okay, history lesson time. So one of the first scientists who tried to measure this atmospheric pressure, his name was Torricelli. And he made, um, it's kind of like a thermometer. Only we don't give it the name thermometer. We actually give it the name barometer, which is where the unit bar comes from, by the way. I mentioned millibars earlier. We call this thing a barometer. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like my, my Oma and Melissa's great grandma, they have like some of these things like, ancient knickknacks kind of things where they'd have like a little pressure thing they put in their house where it says like good weather, bad weather, going to rain. Have you ever seen one of those ones? Where like it's a little needle that shifts depending on what the, what the, what the weather is like. Some of you have. That, that's like a basically it's a barometer. Only it's not like this one here. It's, it's a newer version. Here's how Torricelli's barometer worked. He used mercury. What's unique about mercury? It's a liquid and it's very dense. Okay? Because if you used water... Water is really not dense enough to do that, but mercury is very thick. Okay, like when I think of mercury, um, I think of uh, adamantium off of like off of X Men. You know the scene I'm talking about there? Yeah. I think I think of a really really thick liquid, right? So here here's what ends up happening, right? Hopefully this picture makes sense. He sets up a large dish filled with mercury, and then he sets up more or less a thermometer, and he sucks all the air out. So there is no air in this, by the way. Okay, there is no air particles in this last little bit. Okay, And then he sets it and just kind of leaves it there. Now you would think, well, shouldn't this fall down? Like, shouldn't all of this solid matter fall down due to gravity? But it doesn't. The reason it doesn't is due to air pressure. There are particles in the air right here all over the place, right? That's probably about the right density. Right? And as these particles are moving, they're going to hit this right here, right? Well, as those particles hit the dish right here, it would then reforce them back up the tube. So even though gravity would naturally want these things to fall back down, natural air pressure kind of props them back up again. Does that make sense? So therefore, if there's more pressure, the liquid in the tube gets pushed up a little bit. And if there's less air pressure, then the tube falls. Does that make sense? It's actually absolutely brilliant, minus the mercury part, which is you know toxic and poisonous. But we don't use that anymore. Does that make sense? So he, he called it a barometer. And I mean, this is 400 years ago. This is a long time ago. So Torricelli, in his original instrument, he was measuring things by millimeters. Because literally, it was not that much of a change as the barometer went up and down. And so his original unit of measurement was known as a millimeter of mercury. So if you ever see the unit, mm, and I don't know why I, I, I didn't write it in the slide here. But if you ever see the unit MMHG, that stands for how many millimeters of mercury. The little barometer went up and down. Okay. So B Torricelli, in his, actually, I'm saying this, and I, I, I really mean this, in his wisdom, he actually decided, let's standardize this. So he went to sea level, right? So that we had a nice standard first level to go to. And at sea level, he measured it, and it was 760 millimeters of mercury. By the way, if you ever see a unit somewhere called a tor, a tor is equivalent to a millimeter of mercury. A tor named after Torricelli. So this was the first known unit of pressure. Even though nowadays we use kilopascals, when he first measured it, we measured in this. And we still do on some things. Like I said, blood pressure cuff measures in this. This is the thing I was talking about, by the way. Anyone ever seen one of these before? My Oma had one of these. Right? It measures the temperature, and then it also, this is a barometer right here that kind of is supposed to tell you what the weather is like, because you can make some predictions based on pressure changes on the weather. That's what a weatherman does. So. I actually have that written right here. In general, if pressure is increasing, it usually means good weather is coming. If uh, pressure is falling, it usually means a change in the weather. If you have a low pressure system, it means that there's like a bit of a vacuum occurring, and something new is going to come in and take its place. And usually the thing that comes in and takes its place would be like a storm is kind of moving through. So that's kind of the general rule. I'm not a weatherman, though, so. Did you guys know that Mr. Forster was a weatherman before he was a principal? I'm not kidding. Yeah. Anyways. 
Okay, so one of the goals I have for today is I need you guys to be able to be fluent in the different ways of measuring pressure. Okay, now one of the ways of measuring pressure is as Torricelli did in millimeters of mercury. A second way of measuring pressure is in the metric units of kilopascals. But there's also a third way of measuring pressure. We, we use the term ATM, which is atmospheres. ATM stands for atmospheres. And all of these are interchangeable, and you just need to know the conversion between the two. Okay. Now, I mentioned Torricelli measured 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. In order to be consistent, all of these then are the conversion rates as they would be at sea level. So this was a very precise measurement determined at sea level. I already mentioned this 101.325 number. Well, over time, scientists also started realizing, this is annoying. I'm always working with a number in the hundreds, 760, 100, 101. Like, these are large numbers. So someone said, why don't we just standardize this and make it so that we, we can work with smaller units of measurement? So someone decided, let's make it an atmosphere, and an atmosphere would just be one of them. Now, I wrote a whole bunch of zeros afterwards, but what I need you guys to know is that these zeros really go on infinitely. The idea is that one atmosphere would really be 1.00000. That's what we want to call sea level. So at sea level, you could say there's exactly one atmosphere. That's what we're going to set as the benchmark. Make sense? Sea level is one. If you go above sea level, what would happen to your pressure? It would go down. So like this would be one. This would be 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, right? If you could go below sea level, you probably would have a little bit more pressure. What happens when you go underwater? Yeah. Now, it's not because gases are pushing on you. It's because water is pushing on you, and water is way more. When you're going underwater, there's way more of it than there is uh, air, right? Which is why submarines and underwater vessels have to be highly pressurized because they have to be able to withstand that amount of pressure. So, anyways, an atmosphere then... This is literally defined, it's been defined because it's sea level. Okay, we decided let's go with sea level as being one, and then everything above or below that we can compare it to. But these are the things it's equivalent to. I need you guys, my main goal for today is to be able to convert between all of the different units, because sadly there is no standard unit in pressure. So let's try some examples. That's kind of the last thing I've got today. Let's say you're on Mount Everest, and you go up to the top of Mount Everest, and you bring with you a barometer, because why not? And you take the pressure, and it's 33.7 kilopascals. First question, does that actually even make sense? It makes a lot of sense, because what's the air pressure normally on the Earth? About 101. At sea level, it's 101.325. But if you go way up on top of Mount, Mount Everest, there's less pressure. Why is there less pressure? And why are there less particles? Because gravity is less strong because there's more distance between the Earth and the particles. Yeah, right? You, for you guys, I'm not going to have my grade 12, so I know I did physics, but for you guys in grade 11, there's so many of you here, you guys, did you guys know that gravity decreases in effectiveness the further away you get? Is that something you're aware of? If, if not, now hopefully you're aware. This explains why there's no gravity in outer space. Because when you get further and further away from Earth, gravity has less effect until you get to the point where, like, there really is no gravity and you're weightless in outer space. Does that make sense? Gravity is dependent on distance. So the closer you are to the Earth, the more gravity takes place. It, it also depends on the mass of the Earth, too, by the way. So, like, Earth doesn't have a lot of, has a, has a reasonable amount of gravity, whereas the moon has less gravity because the moon is smaller. Make sense? So there's actually two factors that affect gravity distance and mass. The bigger you are, the more gravity you have, but the further away you are, the less gravity there is. So just to make sure we follow that train of thought. There is less pressure on top of Mount Everest because there are less air particles there. Why are there less air particles there? There's less gravity there. Why is there less gravity there? Well, because it's further away from Earth. The further away you get, the less there is. Right? If I can go back to my very, very first slide, where I started talking about an atmosphere. Earth is known for having all these different layers of atmospheres. I don't actually really know what they all are. But like as you get further up in altitude, 
you basically get to a point where like up here, not only is there no atmosphere, there's also really no gravity, right? Like as you get into outer space, you become weightless. So, all right, anyways, let's get back to my question here. We would like to convert this then to atmospheres. Will this be more than one atmosphere or less than one atmosphere? It has to be less, right? Because this is less than what the standard unit is. So I love trying to work with unit conversions. This is what I would recommend you guys do. I'd say start with 33.7 kilopascals and set it up in such a way that you want to cancel a kilopascal and convert it to an atmosphere. All you need to know now is what is the relationship between atmospheres and kilopascals. And going back to the previous slide, there is exactly one atmosphere, exactly one, like 1.0 infinitely repeated, infinite sig digs, one atmosphere in 101.325 kilopascals. If you guys can kind of see how the ratios work, all I need you to do is divide these two numbers. So I don't have a calculator nearby. Has anybody done this yet? What'd you get? 2235? 3325. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that for now. Let's talk sig digs then. This has three sig digs. This number has been precisely determined so that there's six sig digs. On purpose, it's been determined that way so that this hopefully never limits you in sig digs. You might think this has one sig dig. It does not. It's been chosen as the benchmark so that it has an infinite number of sig digs. So you're limited with three. So it looks like you should have 0 0.333 atmospheres. Way less than sea level. I'm being really redundant today, but hopefully it sinks in. Why? Well, the further up you go, there's less particles. Why are there less particles? Less gravity. That's just how gravity works. Let's try another one. Let's say you go underwater. Underwater is another great example of pressure. Now, it's not due to gases, but we can still talk about pressure at least. The pressure as you go deeper and deeper underwater increases because there's more water on top of you pushing you down, right? The further underwater you go, the more pressure there is because there's more water on top of you pushing you down. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you were in like a wrestling match with your buddies, if you do that, okay? And you're on the bottom of a dog pile. If there's one person on top of you, not so bad. Two people on top of you, getting a little squishy. Ten people on top of you, yeah, you're going to be quite squished. Does that make sense? The further underwater you go, the more pressure there is. So, anyways, long story short, let's say you have 4.2 atmospheres underwater. That's a lot, right? Way more than natural air pressure would give. 4.2 times more than it would give, right? If you want to convert this to millimeters of mercury, here's how I do this. Start with 4.2 atmospheres. And I always start with the number that's not a ratioed number. And then I try to find myself a ratio that converts atmospheres to millimeters of mercury. Because see how those are cancel? All you need to do is know the conversion unit. And again, if you just know what the sea level numbers are, there are 760 millimeters of mercury for every one atmosphere. So in this example here, you need to times by 760. Do you have it? Anybody else have that? Okay, we got a problem though. This is why millimeters of mercury is not a very nice unit to work with, is that it gets very large very fast sometimes. And because of that, um, your sig digs become a problem because you only get two sig digs. Does that make sense? So the only reasonable way to fix this, it would be to say 3.2 times 10 to the 3 millimeters of mercury. That's probably the best way of fixing that. In general, then, you probably wouldn't measure this in the units of millimeters of mercury because you, you would just choose another unit to work with instead. But if you had to, this is how you have to fix it. So I'd actually like to end this here because this is my last slide, correct? Yeah. So if you guys get the concept, really, that's all I want to do today. I wanted to introduce to you guys gases, talk about some stuff that hopefully you already knew kind of, you know, the idea of atmospheres and pressure. But, like, I wanted to consolidate all that knowledge so that hopefully now you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. Wind is really just particles hitting me, right? That's creating pressure on me.
So, but the really the one thing that you guys can do then is try to convert these things. So why don't I kind of call it a day for right now, and then you guys practice these on your own. And if you don't think you get it, just call me over. Does that sound good? Cool. Okay. And then you guys can have the last half hour to kind of get yourself organized for the new unit or finish old stuff or whatever you need to do. So. Any questions, comments, concerns, conundrums, curiosities, complaints, criticisms, queries? I'm out of ideas. No one ever says anything after I do that. You guys are good? Awesome.